The main body of this work on the video today was received by me and placed into an article, or rather two articles, in 2006. Of course, I will be adding to this material in my commentary now in 2022. I also wish to say that some of the imaging that I've created with my avatar is intended to represent a composite of the spirit of this message and not any one individual that is portrayed within it. Murray Hope, in her book, The Lion People, Intercosmic Messengers from the Future, writes about the lion-like beings from Sirius. She calls them the Pashat. Through my Akashic insights and communion with Thoth, I have written on the lion-headed sun lords of Sirius, who guardian the energetic capstone, Telosakara, set over the Eye of Ra, which is a universal locus that has been exposed to instability since the universal tear or schism of space-time in this universe eons ago. The Telosakara has been created by universal intelligences to keep this eye or node in balance. The Sun Lords, or a faction of them, use their tremendous energy focus to constantly recalibrate the capstone. The African elders call these white lions Simbavati, which in the ancient Shagan language means the place where the star lions came down from the heavens. They also refer to them as the children of the sun god. From the Akasha, it has been revealed to me that the star lions of Timbavati were seeded into the then-present golden lion population by the Syrian sun lords through a cosmic event in the skies over Africa. This event consisted of a merkaba of pure energy coming into contact with the DNA of a specific species of lion already then present in Timbavati. The resultant white lions are thus a product of earth lions and genetically engineered Syrian lions, not sun lords, i.e. lion-human forms, but a true lion yet with a bridging crystalline sequence in the DNA that will in the future allow this species to open a path for reunion with the Peshat strain or tribe to come once again into our midst. What purpose would this serve? The lion ones are savants of our future worlds who hold a key to our own evolution perhaps not as intimately as do the cetaceans, who are actually a branch of our past future species. But nevertheless, the lion ones are among us now, incarnating as humans and guiding us at key moments in time. In their true forms, they sing to us the song of our future potential as solar beings beyond our current star sun. In Numis Ohm, which Thoth refers to as the first stage of the new Earth star, that is the world system two we are moving into, the lion ones are present. Their part is to generate energy and maintain stability of matrix and many grids within it of the evolving world field. In communion with the lion-headed sun lord, Idoris, I received the following transmission. Note that all names given are for our benefit, as the communication of the lion ones is largely telepathic, keying off of specific, guttural, yet strangely melodious sounds. And so Idoris speaks. Our history was born from the flame of Kam, a world in the fifth universe, according to our matrix. It was on Kam that our leonine forms developed and merged with the human-like beings that were then present there. This merging was part of a greater plan to unite two golden strains of life that had long ago shared one crucible, as it is on your world, between the cetaceans and earth humans. 
From Khan, we migrated into the realms of Sirius, to the planet Yisuma. Not all of our race, which we will call here Ichktua, I'm going to say that again, Ichktua, are sun lords. This title is more appropriate for those of us who guardian and maintain the capstone over the eye of Ra, the Telosakara. As sun lords, we are reconcilers of the solar emanations as they penetrate planets within our matrix, such as your Earth. If you touch our matrix, we may come to you in vision or dream time and feed you from the flame we guardian in the sacred capstone, for we are the dwellers on the threshold of your cosmic being. I ask, how may we touch your matrix? Hydorus replies, by connecting to the pure flame of the soul Ra, the solar center of being, the golden white sun, as you so intend and visualize this center, it shall be made known to you. And I state, Idoris is referring here to the golden white sun of the 144,000 star suns. As I write in volume two of 1996 Temple Doors in the article Through the Mouth of the Lion, the golden white sun is the embodiment of totality, which is defined in the complete harmony of the 144,000 star suns, composing what Thoth calls the divine body, or Yeshuata Komingi. This divine body carries or contains light codes for the complete template of the human being, the Dam Kadmon. Thoth has spoken of the foundation stars previously, which he defines as those incorporations of living lights which were received in divine consecration in the beginning of creation as a foundation stone for the universal template as it is received to the world of being within the divine Ishatan. Yet even the foundation stars, so Thoth tells me, are within the Yesharata Komingi, which is a greater body, including all components of the heaven temple. Idoris. Our plight, our purpose as sun lords, is to reflect the Yesharata Kumingi. The divine body is in the understanding of your planetary identification, the body of Christ, for it radiates the pure flame of the Christic consciousness through the universe and beyond. I ask, why do you choose the leonine partial form to merge with the human body? Idoris replies, The leonine form is reflected in your natural world from a larger template of creation, that from which we as a race arise. And I ask, Tell us more about the star lines of Timbavati. Do you as sun lords work through them in some way on earth? Idoris they are part of our presence, yet they are animals, creatures of the earth as well. As they hold our presence, so we radiate through them a vibration into the planet. And then I say, as I understand it, the star lions of earth were entirely eradicated through hunting from the wild of South Africa. Only now are plans underway to reintroduce them to the wild of the natural homeland in Timbavati. How important is it that this reintroduction take place? Idoris, it will happen as intended, just as it was necessary for the star lions to go into the world of humankind, so it is now intended that they return to their seeding ground. At this point, I comment in the article, the archetype segment as a mother energy being of universal proportions holds the flame of the lion ones, for she offers us a portal into their realm, which is really an aspect of our own being. Understand that every creature on this earth is an aspect of our life expression on earth, or it would not be present here with us. It is interesting that Sekhmet was called the Eye of Ra by the ancient Egyptians. Her name means she who is powerful. 
I have been shown that she is represented in the Black Madonna as one who waits to be known in the heart of the lion. It was revealed to me in the Akasha that Mu, Lemuria, the motherland of humankind on earth, the divine feminine was depicted as Mukla, the love light breath of creation. She was seen in several different forms, each one intended to represent an aspect of her nature. One of these forms was a lion-headed woman carrying a golden and white sphere in one hand intended to represent the golden white sun or later to be called the Eye of Ra. In the other hand, she held a digiti, that's D-I-J-T-I, which was an object that looked like a small whip with three strands attached to it. These were the three waves of universal streams that compose our working universal system. As Tushpa, the lion one, so Mullah became a builder of world matrices, much like the sun lords of Sirius. Tushpa was black in color with large golden eyes. Her blackness was the void before creation and also that which is hidden until light is brought from the golden white sun of what we would call Christ consciousness to illuminate the all. Idoris. I give this symbolic mandala as a contact point for accessing our matrix. Move into the center of the mandala and then out again, back and forth, until the golden white sun is visible in your brow, third eye. It is then that you may experience with us that which we offer the human element of earth. This is insight into the future design that is in actuality already within you. The accompanying mantra, Al Om M Atba Re. I wish to pause and comment here that you need not use this specific symbol that was given to me, although I believe it is a powerful one. You can go in your inner vision, in your inner eye, and experience the golden white sun. Now we begin with the second article, written just a short time later. These are correlations to Thoth material in regard to the book written by Linda Tucker, Mystery of the White Lions. In her masterful book, Mystery of the White Lions, Children of the Sun God, Linda Tucker relates the incredible story of the white lions of Timbavati in South Africa. The lion priest Mutwa revealed to Linda Tucker the meaning of the name Timbavati, the place of coming down. He then proceeded to tell Linda the story, which the Bushmen of Timbavati consider to be authentic history of Queen Numbi's encounter with the star object and the shining one. Numbi, a rain queen for her people, was prostrate from illness in her hut one night when a blazing object streaked across the sky and came to earth only miles from her village. She instructed her women to help her to walk, and slowly she traversed the distance to where the object sat upon the earth. It was a spherical light, sitting like a newborn sun upon the ground. From it emitted humming synchronicity. After a while, a god emerged from the bluish light. He was like the shining light so she could not see his facial features, seeing only the outline of his body. The being raised his hand in salutation to her, and she approached him, leaving her servant women cowering behind her. She was taken into the light with the being. The spherical star then rose into the sky and accelerated into the heavens. It is said that at a later time, Queen Numbi did return to her people with great wisdom to share. Many years after the star object had landed in this very region of Africa, white animals began to be born. These were not albinos, but true genetically white creatures. Among them were antelope and impala. Some of these had only one horn instead of two and with blue eyes. There were some white elephants, baboons, and leopards as well, and the white lions, many with blue eyes. 
While the other white ones eventually disappeared, the white lions continued to be born. More recently, it has been discovered that the Timbavati is especially high in radioactivity. It is postulated by Linda Tucker and others that the star sphere, having landed there, may have emitted a strong radioactive field. When I wrote my first article on the star lions, I had not yet read Linda Tucker's book, only having seen her website at the time. I then read her book before writing this article. I have written on the Sun Lords of the Telosakara as being with the body of a human and the head of a lion. The lion shaman told Linda Tucker that their highest gods possessed the head of a lion and the body of a human being. As Linda points out in her book, the Sphinx has the head of a man and the body of a lion. I find this significant as the companions of Horus, whom I know of as the Neferatim, are the guardians of the Sphinx and the grid it anchors into the earth. From my Akashic perspective, the Sphinx holds one charge of a field of light, which is anchored at the other end in the Timbavati. Linda Tucker suggests something similar in the mystery of the white lions. The lion priest Mutwa spoke to Linda Tucker about the, I'll have to spell this, A-B-A-N-G-A-F-I, Abangafi, and the last name is B-A-P-A-K-A-D-E, Bapa, Bapa, Kandi, the shiny ones, who are brilliant leonine ones helpful to bring love, light, and truth to the humans of our earth. These, I believe, are what Thoth calls the Syrian sun lords, the lion-headed ones of the Telosakara. Mutwa's own guide and guardian is a being whom I believe is probably an aspect of Sekhmet. Mutwa describes her to Linda as one of the eternal ones working with the evolution of this planet. The white lions are understood by the indigenous people of Timbavati as custodians and messengers of the Shining Ones. These white creatures are indeed Shining Ones themselves, for they are over-lighted and animated by the gods of the stars. Although a relatively new, some 400 years ago, presence in the Timbavati, the white lions are referred to by the lion priest Mutwa as being very ancient beings that are as old as life itself. Not far from Timbavati are the ruins of the ancient city of Great Zimbabwe. In her book, Linda Tucker writes about the connection between the star lions and the master builders of Zimbabwe. She entitles this chapter, Great Zimbabwe, Resting Place of the Lion. The lion shaman Mutwa revealed to Linda that the design of the Great Zimbabwe complex was astronomically correlated to the Syrian star system. This certainly aligns with those revelations to me on the Syrian sun lords. In conclusion to Linda Tucker's chapter on the resting place of the lion, she writes that both Timbavati and Zimbabwe were laid out on precisely the same degree of longitude, the same longitude as the great Sphinx of Giza at 3114 East. I was especially interested in the chapter in Linda's book entitled Lion Priests and Eagle Shamans. To the Bushmen, the eagle is venerated alongside the lion. The Zulu would never kill an eagle or a lion, believing them both to be divine creatures of the heavens. Thoth has opened the Akashic scroll for me in the past about the star eagles race, whom he also calls the shepherds. These kindred are branches of the Solarians of the Sunbow clan. The star eagles are a star race who were the primary seeders of this planet. They worked in tandem with the Syrian sun lords in anchoring the temples of light, the grids of divine assemblage on earth, and genetically opening pathways to strengthen and regenerate a lost code of humanity, easing it back toward its true nature. Mutwa told Linda Tucker that he was descended from a select priesthood, 
that had its origins with beings of a divine nature named Wandao, lion, and Nitswana, eagle or hawk. Mutwa referred to these beings as being imbued with stellar powers. Mutwa spoke of the four steps of initiation for the lion shaman, the fourth stage being the evolution into the lion, eagle, hawk, man, serpent identity, the guardian of sacred knowledge, known mythologically as the griffin. To the indigenous Africans, it is the Nipenvu, the beast of truth. Thoth refers to the griffin as a morphic creature. Such a being, so he tells me, is created through eons of souls in this dimension or higher realms, focusing certain specific lines of creational energy into a cauldron of etheric malleability, a soup of new form and dimension. Thoth refers to the griffin Nepenvu by its even more ancient alloy name of Amsk Adi. The Lemurians communed with these beings in their temples, and some priests even rode upon their back in states of what the Eastern tradition called Samadhi. On page 242 of Mystery of the Star Lions, Linda Tucker writes about the Vitruvian man as drawn by Da Vinci. She states that this image may have originally been connected to the concept of star gods. I find this interesting as Thoth guided me to use this image in the medallion I created for my article on the Neferatim. The wanton canned hunting of the white lions of Timbavadi have eliminated them from the wild until recently. Thanks to Linda Tucker and her colleagues, they are now being reintroduced into protected areas. Linda Tucker summarizes my own Akashic perceptions when she writes in The Mystery of the White Lions that the white lions are truly radiant beings of light incarnated in lion form that embody the solar logos. The light fields of Numis Om are the first stage of the New Earth Star, or what Thoth calls the etheric webbing holding together the moving streams of ether into which the new earth star and thus Numis Om is building, creating, shifting, and constantly renewing its dimension and substance. In the electromagnetic realm of our current earth, this webbing is much denser and more magnetic. This creates a certain stability in what is and what isn't. For instance, if you set an apple down on the table, you can be reasonably certain that when you return to it five minutes later, it will still be an apple and not an orange. Of course, I must say here, this is in, within the context of our particular reality stream and how we see and focus on things, because there are multidimensional aspects of this. In such realms as Numis Om and our own inner earth, Apples may shift to oranges quite easily, just as an ocean current will take away a palm frond from the beach and replace it with a shell. However, beings who dwell in these realms are equipped with certain crystalline packets in the brain and DNA, which allow them to access these changes and move with them in a way that is coherent and productive. As these light fields dance, expanding, contracting, and relocating, so they create splendorous auroras in the skies of Numis Om. Beneath these heavenly light shows are sweeping plains surrounded by high mountains. This reality is a first level being generated by the light fields. A second or third level would look quite differently. You do not get from the first to the second level by moving through space-time from one point to another. You shift the crystalline patterns in your body, and there you are. The first level of the light fields is the region that is guardianed by the white lions. It is the entry point of Numis Om. The white star lions in the ascended state of Numis Om are truly shining ones, their whiteness beyond the brilliance we know on earth. All the colors and contrasts of light in Numis Om are exceedingly luminous and vivid. I am especially moved to learn from Idoris, the lion-headed sun lord, that the white lions, 
who are being massacred for profit in Timbavati are assuming ascended states in Numis Om as a distinct tribe of light beings working to assist the natural realm of Earth in its regenesis. This special tribe, Hydoris calls the Kimbaza. Among the Kimbaza are those lion ones who incarnated as golden lions carrying the white gene, also being true star lions under the flesh. I decided to leave that little meow in there. It was so on target. The Kambaza star lions hold like a flaming sword the light of compassion for humanity. They who were killed by humans for profit, indeed bred and raised to be released into regions specifically to be killed by the highest bidder. Thoth further enlightened me that this is their Christic mission, not only to forgive, but to enlighten those souls who partake in such unconscious murder. Just how do the Kambaza enlighten them? Thoth replied to me that this comes through the dream state and through presenting these individuals with life scenarios, while perhaps not pleasant, will nevertheless be instructive. This is the aspect of segment that the Kambaza demonstrate to the darker side of humanity. They do not do this out of revenge, but love. Temple of the Lion In Numis Om, there is a temple of the lion in which priests and priestesses who maintained such a temple structure in Lemuria and later Egypt continue this connection to spirit through the high deva of the lion being. Their ceremonies and rituals are very much attuned to the rhythms and cycles of the Rigel star sun, the sun of the new earth, Numis Om as the lion is the natural embodiment of the solar logos. The indigenous African name for the star lions is Tasu, which means star beast. Thoth tells me that this word is actually ancient Aloy or Lemurian in origin and was used to mean both lion and star. In her book, Mystery of the Star Lions, Linda Tucker tells of a Bushman mother holding a newborn up to the heavens and saying, Tasu, Tasu asking the stars to bless her baby with the heart of a lion. Linda Tucker writes that the lion priest Mutwa told her that one of the stars in the belt of Orion was called by his people the Lion Star. The constellation of Leo was called the Exiled Lion. Thoth relates to me that the star Denebula in the constellation of Leo is a portal star to the golden star of Mazuriel in the Atasic or greater non-dualistic universe. Mazuriel is the ultimate Christ star as it radiates the uniting forces of this entire universe, drawing it back toward and eventually into the higher heaven of the Atasic. The Temple of the Lion on Numis Om holds the star grids in its light field for the various stars and grouping of stars in the universe which contain the radiating frequencies of the divine logos. This divine logos is contained within the solar logos, thus all these stars that are lion stars are one and the same as being Christ stars. While the star lions hold the vibration of the Christic solar logos, the unicorns vibrate at the capstone of the Christ star summit. The lion is the foundation and the unicorn is the capstone. Together they form a powerful union of Christic spirit for the new light ascension hologram now being evolved on earth, that which Thoth calls the new earth star hologram. As Linda Tucker mentions in her book, the lion and the unicorn are often seen together in medieval tapestries and heraldry. Now for a shamanic journey with the star lions. Place yourself in a relaxed meditative state and ask to be escorted through a visionary journey with the star lions into Numis Om. You may conduct this journey any way you choose, 
but below I offer some guidelines. Focusing through your third eye, imagine a beautiful diamond-shaped clear crystal. It is set in the midst of a pale lavender sky. The diamond begins a pulsing blue to violet flash. The cycle of the pulses starts slowly and then gradually increasing in frequency until the moment in between flashes are so brief, the flashing seems more like a brilliant flickering. Now concentrate just on the flash flicker itself, tuning out everything else. Feel yourself move inside the light and into the center of the diamond crystal. The blue and violet light becomes golden, then pure white radiance. As the whiteness seems to dissipate, you now see that you are in a field of tall grasses and exquisite flowers with hazy blue-green mountains in the distance. The sky is a deep lapis. You notice tiny pinpoints of light amidst pink and golden clouds. The air smells so clean and pure and tinged with the perfume of the flowers around you. As you gaze about, suddenly you see two flowers become two blue eyes framed by a massive bushy head of a white male lion. Instead of fear, you feel a strong sense of kinship. His strong stare softens a bit. He raises his head into the breeze and you see his mate beside him stir and rise, standing shoulder deep in the grass. She is Sekhmet personified, her eyes a deeper blue than the male. She seems to arrest time and space with her intense focus upon you. Caught in the snare of that suspended moment, you notice that the male is now standing as well. He takes the first tentative step towards you. He is not fearful, but merely respectful of your sensitivity and need to adjust to his presence. He awaits your encouragement, and then his eyes brighten as he walks with a sure and regal step toward you, stopping within a foot from your reach. The lioness follows suit, only she comes right up to you and rubs her large and majestic head against your chest, circles you once, and then lies down at your feet. Spend some time with these beings. I know them as White Flame, the male, and Moonstar, the female. After your heart speaking with these two incredible star lions, ask them to take you deeper into Numis Om, beginning with the Temple of the Lion. There you will meet the priestess Tilakai and explore your own lion being. In conclusion, here on this day of May in 2022, we are at a real crossroads in the reality war. And you've probably been watching my series, maybe, maybe not, but I do have a series called The Reality War. And the gist of it is simply that things are shifting what we believe to be real, not real, timelines, all of these things. And I call it a war because there's a, another faction of energy in the light and dark struggle that would like to take us off of the divine trajectory. So when we look at what we're discussing here in this video, not just the star lines, not just the star lords, the, the um, lion-headed solar lords, but the whole picture of how these things work in quantum energy, in the field. We need to realize that we are the ones that are creating the field, and we are the ones summoning 
the higher light beings to our stead. The, the sun lords, star lions, star eagles, angels of light, illumined masters, you name it. <laughs> we are calling them forth. And it is up to us to stay clear and centered to do that. We don't have to be perfect. We just have to keep bringing ourselves back to center and calling upon these magnificent ones. Now, obviously, there is no real separation. So that means the magnificent ones and us are, are one. But in the schism that, that souls have created in their awareness, there are these evolutioning, evolutionizing frequencies moving through the field. And as Thoth has said in the past, this may sound like splitting hairs, but souls are not evolving. The, they are becoming more aware, and in that awareness, things around them change to give them a greater perspective, and that is their evolution. So it is important for us now to um, think of these beings, these morphies, these divine creatures, part human, part uh, animal, totemic, as not some strange creation, but simply an amalgam of our own heart-centered being, where we are part of that animal realm and we are part of that human realm because all is one. We don't have to necessarily understand every detail of any of this. It has to go to the heart. What does the heart tell you? And when you feel that intelligence speaking in the heart, then you can call upon these master beings, whether they're angels or star lions or whatever, and you will feel them as part of you. And that is where the, the light road to eternity begins within you. The Cydonia Institute Field Journal, Volume 1, Number 6, The Feline Side of the 1998 Face on Mars by George J. Haas, June 1998, revised February 2020. Since Hoagland first did his famous mirroring split of the face on Mars, the feline side has always been considered to be a male African lion. With the new 1998 MOC image of the Cydonia face, the feline characteristics are even more apparent. The features of the feline face, when duplicated, are composed by a square-shaped head with a crowned headdress, a mane, squinting eyes, an ornamented nose feature, an almost circular muzzle, and a snarling mouth with fangs. The deep V-shaped cleft seen on Olmec and Maya artifacts is symbolic of a split corn husk cut into the head of the maize god. It is from this cleft that fresh corn sprout emerges. This same reference to corn can be seen on the humanoid side of the Cydonia face with the identification of the tri-leaf emblem on its forehead. According to what I received from Thoth Intelligence years ago, the face on Mars in Cydonia is intended to represent both human and lion-headed star-lords of Sirius. This is the uh, symbol of the connection between the humanoid Syrians and the star lion Syrians. It is represented there because the whole Cydonia complex is a combination project of the, of, of the blue star Rigel Orions and the Syrian star lords. You'll notice on the map above that the Pleiades, Orion, and Sirius are represented. So this is the whole starplex that Thoth speaks about. In 1994, I did a remote viewing inside 
uh, one of the pyramids in the Cydonia complex. And I'm going to read to you here what I saw there that I placed in the uh, Temple Doors issue of 1994. The sarcophagi are the tombs of Inithi. Within these 16 tombs, or sealed capsules, lie suspended beings, the first lords of Kara, Inithi, city of lords. Their original physical systems carry the genetic substance that began the shepherd genetics on earth. There is far too much to relate concerning this history, over a half a million years, to reveal to you at this time. We say here that these Inithi, or masters, are the forebears of all the goodly company of shepherds on earth, and that one day they shall reassume their physical forms, which have lain in state for eons of time, so that they may reconstitute the spiritual genetics of earth. Well, I find this very similar to what Thoth also gave me, and I can't remember whether it was before or after, I believe after this, about the uh, suspended forms uh, beneath uh, Lake Mioris. A very similar context. So obviously, these aren't the only ones. Why are all these suspended bodies involved? I have no idea. It's obviously a much bigger picture than he's willing to share with me even at this time. However, we see this spiritual genetics of Earth being reconstituted, partly, yes, for the actual um, ability to uh, move into a world system too, that is, the building of the pure gem body, but it won't be completed by that time. So uh, this is a continuing project that goes on into the vibrational realm of a world system too, in our case, the new Earth star. Then I ask Thoth Intelligence about what I saw there that I was calling a wind tunnel. And he replies, this is the Kayum, a tunnel of highly accelerated itons, creating a casual reality spinner wave, which is by definition a double helix Siegel field of inverted atoms. You may understand it better as an intense spinning of itons, which are atoms turned inside out, in a double helix motion, spinning rapidly about a central moving axis. Well, in this, Thoth is using some Thoth-speak terms here. I, I won't go into it all. I just wanted to give you an overall view, so I continue. The kytium is the iton vortex spinner, connecting the controlling mechanism for the telosakara that is within the temple of the universal being to the ta. This, then, is the cable linking the two operations together. Thoth also gave me some information on the face itself saying that it was a version of the, the Lord Melchizedek, uh, which is a, a Venusian uh, Thothic presence, but that was the human side. He did not address the lion in this particular article. So um, we see this face as being represented uh, the progenitor of the rising of the spiritual consciousness on the planet after the quote-unquote fall uh, connection. And then we see uh, the other side, the lion one, as the uh, telesakara and the lion-headed ones that are uh, overseeing the, um, the raising of the energy fields of not only Earth, but that part, that spectrum of the holographic universe back into connection with the full metatronic light field. Well, this video has gone on longer than expected. I like to keep my videos short, but I felt it was necessary to include the Mars factor in this. So I want to end with just a personal note. In the material I read to you on the star lines where there is a um, visualization given, a meditational visualization, and the male lion, the name given in this meditation, is White Flame. Well, I found that very interesting to read again after all these years because less than a year ago, I brought a new kitty into my fold, 
I now have four. And his name was given to me as Nim, N-I-M-H. However, just a little later, it was given Nim of the White Flame. And so when I reread this article, I couldn't help but see the connection. Obviously, this little kitty isn't a star lion, but he's so special. I've never had an animal in my life, and I've had a lot of them, cats and dogs both, that has such an incredible awareness and love factor within him. He just shines with love, and he has sort of a human-like look in his face that's almost eerie. Anyway, so I just felt that this little bitty being was somehow a fractal, maybe, of this uh, energy field that is connected to the sacred star lines. 